Yeah, and that's a perfect segue really just to start talking about this, the waivers and the waiver process. So David, I'm gonna uh, put this one back over to you. The FAA look for when they're considering whether or not to grant a waiver. Well, each waiver application is unique in of itself uh, based on the needs of the applicant. So for a successful waiver application, it is important for the applicant to work cooperatively with his or her FAA waiver team. There's more information there on the FAA website uh, on current uh, waivers that have been awarded, so you can actually use that as a template and then uh, begin the process. You know, I, I've gone on the FAA's website, and like I said, I you know, huge props because it's amazing. Uh, not only do they have the you know the whole list of the waivers that are granted, but you can click on them and and read what they actually say. So you know, as as a drone operator or someone advising them as an attorney. You can go on and kind of see, you know, almost reverse engineer backwards in time as to what went into that initial package to get the approval that 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 uh, uh, company or, or that person received. So great stuff. Uh, Ryan, speaking of resources, uh, the FAA, you know, we know has a ton uh, out there. What else what do they have to help commercial users understand the waiver process and a better chance of success in their application? to obtain one other than that list of waivers that have already been granted that we just mentioned. Okay, well, uh, at the uh, the end of uh, this presentation, I've uh, uh, uploaded uh, several different websites from, the, uh, the FAA actually has a waiver explanation guide and like a cheat sheet, a how-to, uh, step-by-step, which uh, it's, uh, it's a downloadable PDF and uh, all that information is from frequently asked questions to COAs to test sites. All that's going to be at the end of this presentation. And of course, you can also follow the FAA on Facebook, LinkedIn, Drone Zone uh, for other information. Okay, wonderful. And and again, being hypersensitive to acronyms, you use the term COA. Can you explain to this crowd who's <laughs> Primarily social crowd, I would think, although we might have some public safety folks in here. Uh, what a COA is exactly? Sure. It's a certificate of waiver or authorization. That's what COA stands for. And that's part of the uh, waiver process. Think of it as uh, you for your specific uh, operation. It's going to be where you're operating and where you're testing your drone and your operation. And uh, there's a uh, processing website, which will be number four in my uh, references sheet at the end of this, which they call the Application Processing System, or CAPS. Thank you so much. And, and I'll put this one back over to Dr. Nilsson. I know you talked about some limitations and your experience with the waiver process. Can you provide us any lessons learned from that process? Absolutely, Don. Um, um, the, the biggest lesson learned is like Ryan said, you should probably, and even you said, you should probably check out those links. Those links are absolutely a wealth of information. Read all the ones that have been approved, read the guides, um, the Drone Zone website, just download everything you can and expect um, that it might be rejected on the first time and you get an email and then you get told um, we need additional information and don't get discouraged by that. You have to show the FAA that you're as safe as you possibly can be. And so that's, um, that's it's just a lot of reading and nitpicking, but that's my advice. Well, perfect. And, and that's where maybe lawyers come into play and to help clients. And so Mary, Caitlin, I, I want to talk to you a little bit because you, you've helped clients obtain these waivers. And um, uh, so I want to know, and, and the crowd wants to know, do, we, do you have any practical tips? You know, obviously not legal advice, as we talked about up front, but um, when a client walks in your office or gives you a phone call, uh, you know, kind of to quote Jerry Maguire, you know, help me, help you, you know, what do, what do you tell them? What, what do you ask them to help, help them in this process? Sure, Don. Again, my first and most basic piece of advice on this topic would be to carefully review and follow the instructions that are on the FAA waiver portal of the, the drone zone that we've been discussing. One of the main reasons that waiver applications are rejected, so I hear from a lot of my former FAA colleagues, is because the applicant didn't follow the instructions. 
Um, so that would be my first piece of advice. Follow, read and follow the instructions. Um, second, it's important that the waiver application address the safety risks and mitigation strategies that are unique and specific to the operation for which the waiver is being sought. So while there is a lot of great information available on the FAA website about previous waivers that have been granted, and that is, that's useful and really important information to have, you should not base the substance of your application on someone else's previously approved waiver. Um, you know, for one thing, I think the FAA will probably be able to tell that you've done this. Um, and most importantly, you're going to miss the meat or the, the raw data uh, and the accompanying safety analysis that the FAA is looking for if you've based your, your application on someone else's con ops and mission. It's one thing to make a conclusory statement that your operation will take place in a rural area and you're therefore unlikely to fly over any people during your beyond visual line of sight operation. Uh, it's another thing to actually provide geographic and location data, pinpointing the exact location of your proposed operation, backed up with current census and population data as objective evidence that this risk is low. So th there's a big difference between those two approaches. And the difference is, could mean you know, the difference between an application that's tossed in the trash and one that's eventually granted. Um, finally, I would advise that you use the waiver safety explanation guidelines or the WSEG that our, um, our FAA panelists have referenced um, to your advantage. For those who don't know, you know, the, the waiver safety explanation guidelines are the series of questions that are tied to the operational rules of Part 107. Um, and all applicants must respond to the general WSEG, which address the operational details, general information about the aircraft, pilot and personnel details, and operational risks and mitigations. Um, but applications also have to respond to specific WSEG questions uh, for the type of waiver that's being requested. Beyond visual line of sight, for example, has its own WSEG, as does operations over people. So when you go through and you're addressing the WSEG, um, when you're prompted in the application, I would recommend also using them as an outline for your responses to other sections of the application. And in, when you're responding to each item, don't assume that the FAA knows anything about your operation that you have not explicitly stated in the application. Um, and I would say that this general rule applies even if you've had previous conversations or communications about your operation with the FAA. I hear a lot of people say, well, I didn't think I had to put that in because, you know, I've been emailing with the waiver team about this issue and they know about it. Uh, but you still need to address it in the application. Um, you should really think of the waiver application as a completely freestanding representation of what you're going to be doing, the inherent risks, and the mitigating factors. Well, that, that, that's a lot of great advice. And, you know, we're talking about waivers, and one of the areas where people seek a waiver is beyond visual line of sight operations, as we've mentioned before, BV loss. You know, and some people are calling BV loss the holy grail of scalable commercial drone operations. Uh, in fact, I have an article coming out uh, on that topic soon in uh, Inside Unmanned Systems magazine uh, with respect to uh, a particular industry. But Dr. Nilsson, uh, how do you see BV loss opening up the aperture for the commercial drone industry? And what, ca what use cases specifically do you, do you see it that it will enable? Uh, yes, um, I would say that drone deliveries are at the forefront, but I also see a lot of public safety usage, for example, in a hurricane to search for life in a debris or to assess the area to make sure it's safe to send in a team and there's no gas leaks, for example. Especially up here in our neck of the woods, forest fires, um, maybe get a scale of how it's progressing so that the firefighters have a, a better understanding of what they're up against before they go there before they jump in. Um, and as you know, um, the FAA came up with the tactical BVLOS waiver recently. Um, I feel like it's still fairly restrictive, but it's a good beginning. And I think also inspections. Inspections could benefit from easier uh, operations, power line inspections, pipelines, et cetera, especially if they're in the middle of nowhere, you know, for miles and miles in an absolute um, not populated area. So the um, oil, gas, utilities, insurance, any time you need to increase safety, let's say not have a human being um, leaning out of a helicopter or climbing up a tall pole, um, whenever you need to decrease cost, um, a $1,500 an hour helicopter operation uh, instead of a drone, um, 
whenever you need to improve data collection too and the quality of the data because it's it's much better um, and much more value time to value meaning and then you have the data much more rapidly so i think those those are where we're going to see some use cases that's that's awesome and there's so many different uses and i, I think people are referring to it as the holy grail right because it's like it's out there ever elusive and so Ideally, we'll, we will be in a situation where you don't need a waiver for beyond visual line of sight. Uh, so David, let me ask you, what will it take, do you think, for the FAA to allow BV loss to be the norm and not the exception to the rule? Well, as you know, the FAA is about to implement the remote ID at the end of this year. Uh, before beyond visual line of sight can be considered by the FAA, remote ID must be in place first. Once the rule is in place, the FAA will begin to look at the addressing operations over people and then beyond visual line of sight in that order, unless something changes. Remote ID will help pave the way to operations over people and beyond visual line of sight and SUAS, but there's no timeline on when this will occur at this time. Uh, but again, as uh, Dr. Nielsen has said, uh, uh, there are some certain circumstances that involve public use entities like first responders that work with the FAA to ascertain tactical beyond visual line of sight. And uh, the FAA website does have more information on tactical beyond visual line of sight. Now that's exactly right. And you know, you, you mentioned the tactical beyond visual line of sight uh, waiver process that's now in place. And Mary Caitlin had earlier mentioned drone responders. So a huge shout out to Charles Werner and that team that worked with a number of public safety agencies in the FAA to make that happen. I mean, that's pretty amazing. Uh, so, so back over to you, Mary Caitlin, then. Um, once again, kind of in this uh, help me help you mindset, uh, what, what, uh, what advice would you give to a client seeking a waiver for BV loss in particular? Well, Don, you're right to refer to BV loss as the holy grail of waivers because they're among the most difficult waivers to obtain. And this is mainly because the vast majority of the operating rules under Part 107 are rooted in the assumption that the remote piloting command has physical eyes on the UAS during the entire flight, and that the pilot can actually see and ensure in real time that the operation is being conducted safely um, by, for example, avoiding aircraft and people, identifying changes in weather patterns, and detecting any technical malfunctions that may occur on the aircraft during flight. But in BV loss, because the pilot can't physically see the aircraft, and because physical sight is the bedrock for many of the operating rules under Part 107, the FAA considers these operations to be among the highest risk. Um, practically, what that means when you're applying for a waiver is that you need to understand that the FAA is looking for a greater level of detail in a beyond visual line of sight waiver application, particularly with respect to the proposed technology that you're going to use and the operator's ability to use that technology to comply with the other parts of 107. So when you're developing your safety cases and your con ops, you need to focus even greater effort on providing a detailed description of the operations and a robust justification, including any applicable technical documentation of how the operation is gonna be conducted safely. So in a BV loss context, this means that an applicant must demonstrate that the pilot is capable of meeting the detect and avoid and seeing requirements, even though the pilot's not going to be able to actually see the aircraft um, with unaided vision. Um, of course, the applicant's ability to meet these requirements depends heavily on the technology features of the, the aircraft that the applicant has selected um, and how effectively the applicant can demonstrate the capability and the reliability of the key systems on the UAS. So, I, you, I think the main takeaway here is you really need to think of the beyond visual line of sight waiver as a technology waiver and build your application around that concept. Yeah, that's a great point. And, you know, we talked about operations over people being another area ripe for waivers. And so, David, back over to you. Um, how many of these are you seeing in the FAA? You know, basically, how many are being granted? Is it different than the holy grail of BV loss? Are we seeing more? Well, there's no real average uh, of how many, uh, again, FAR Part 107.39 waivers, which is the operations over people, uh, are, are awarded to applicants. But as of today, the total number of waivers awarded since two, 2017 have been about 151. Operations over uh, people waiver is a complex waiver to ascertain, but 
ballot, an applicant can receive it as long as he or she works closely, again, with the FAA waiver team that is assigned to the applicant. And again, there's more information on the FAA website uh, if, uh, if you want to look for it. Okay, perfect. And, and Ryan, we just heard a lot from Mary Caitlin on what makes a successful BV loss waiver package. I assume a lot of that translates over also into ops over people. What's, what's the FAA looking for there? Well, Mary hit it right on the head uh, earlier about having uh, a full package and having it complete. Um, when, Like any waiver, you want to work closely with your waiver team. Um, you want to follow all the instructions closely and have that successful waiver package. So each package is unique. Uh, it, it's based upon the needs of the applicant, the technology you're using. So work with your waiver team to ensure a nice, complete package. 